Well, good morning, everyone. As you can see, we're, uh, we're set up a little differently today. Um, I think it should be a high Sabbath, and I hope that everyone here is blessed um, by the presentation today. But we are Perpetual Praise, um, and our presentation this morning is entitled Soldiers of the Cross. So who are they exactly? Why are they needed? And how do you become one? These are the questions that I hope we can answer today. So it all starts with this thing called the Great Controversy. Now what is that exactly? Is that even a real thing? Or is it just a made up metaphor to make a point? Um, are there really two sides engaging in warfare on this unseen battlefield, fighting over you and me. I want to tell you that this battle is very real, and we are right in the middle of it. We are locked in a life and death struggle for the control of this world, with the winners and losers having eternal consequences. There is no neutral ground in this war, and we have to pick a side. Through the music presented today, it will tell the story of the great controversy and how you can become a soldier, of a soldier of the cross. Now, there was a survey done by the Barna Group, and it said that 40, this is of Christians, 40% of Christians strongly agree with the statement that Satan is not a living being but a symbol of evil, and another 19% somewhat agreed with that statement. So that's almost 60% that don't totally believe that Satan is actually even a real thing. 26% of the respondents strongly disagreed, meaning they believe Satan is real, and then another 9% somewhat disagreed. This study was done back in 2009, and I can't imagine any of the numbers are any better than they are today. There are Christians out there who don't believe that Satan is even real. But let me assure you that he is. And he is working ever so hard for the control of your mind. So where did this all start, you may be asking. We have to go back to the beginning before the beginning in Revelation 12, 7 through 9. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So here we have the beginning of the great controversy. The first time sin has entered into heaven. And we are seeing the fulfillment of that before our very eyes today. Great controversy, page four, says... The great controversy between good and evil will increase in intensity to the very close of time. In all ages, the wrath of Satan has been manifested against the church of Christ, and God has bestowed his grace and spirit upon his people to strengthen them to stand against the power of the evil one. But as the church approaches her final deliverance, Satan is to work with great power. He comes down having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time, Revelation 12:12. 12, 12. All the depths of satanic skill and subtlety acquired, all the cruelty developed during these struggles of the ages, will be brought to bear against God's people in the final conflict. And in this time of peril, the followers of Christ are able to bear to the world the warning of the Lord's second advent, and the people are to be prepared to stand before him at his coming, without spot and blameless, 2 Peter 3.14. At this time, the special endowment of divine grace and power is not less needful to the church than in apostolic days. The battle is getting more intense, my friends. As we just read, Satan attacks are going to ramp up as the end approaches because he knows that his time is short. So when you fight a battle, you need soldiers. Not one of us is exempt from this war. There are no draft deferrals. We all have a decision to make. We can choose to be soldiers of the cross or by default be soldiers for Satan. 
There is no neutrality. You're either on one side or the other. So when Israel had to fight their battles, they would often send out messengers to assemble the army. So we find one such example right before Saul becomes king. The Ammonites had surrounded Jabesh Gilead. And do any of you know what they had threatened to do to the people of Jabesh Gilead? I see someone pointing. Yes, they were going to put out their right eye. Does not sound, it was kind of their trademark. Um, it does not sound very fun. But we find this call to serve in 1 Samuel eleven six 6-9. When Samuel heard their words, the Spirit of God rushed upon him. And he burned with great anger. He took a pair of oxen, cut them in pieces, and sent them by messengers throughout the land of Israel, proclaiming, This is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not march behind Saul and Samuel. Then the terror of the Lord fell upon the people, and they turned out as one man. And when Saul numbered them at Bezek, there were 300,000 Israelites and 30,000 men of Judah. So they said to the messengers who had come, Tell the men of Jabesh Gilead, deliverance will be yours tomorrow by the time the sun is hot. If we could only see a turnout like that for the soldiers in this battle today. The call to serve in this battle is no less real than it was in Israel's day. We need recruits for this battle. Soldiers who are willing to fight and give everything for the cause. We need to tell people what is going on because, like the survey says, they don't even realize it's happening because their life depends on it. We need to sound the battle cry because the foe is surely nigh. Now, our first number today is a very special number. It was arranged specifically for today by our very own Daniel Oriana. Way to go. Um, so you guys are getting the world premiere of this song. So you guys should feel very special. Um, so this is actually a medley entitled The Sound of Heaven, which is a combination of Sound the Battle Cry and When We All Get to Heaven.
The one thing that every army needs is a strong leader, someone who is in charge of the master plan. Without a, without a strong leader and no organized plan of action, an army has no chance of being successful. Our battle today is no different. When God first chose his people, it was set up that he would be the leader and he would use his prophets to deliver his messages. We think of Moses, Joshua, and Samuel, just to name a few, who fulfilled their duties faithfully. They led the people as God directed them to, but this was not good enough for the people of Israel. They wanted a king so they could be like the other nations. 1 Samuel 8, 4 through 8. Then all the leaders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You see, the people had rejected God. But Samuel, and he, we might take this a little personally too, but God was telling them, it's not you, Samuel, it's me. Do what they want. So we read on Patriots and Prophets, page 603. The government of Israel was administered in the name and by the authority of God. The work of Moses of the 70 elders and the rulers and judges was simply to enforce the laws that God had given. They had no authority to legislate for the nation. The Lord foresaw that Israel would desire a king, but he did not consent to a change in the principles upon which the state was founded. The king was to be the vicegerent of the Most High. God was to be recognized as the head of the nation, and his law to was, was to be enforced as the supreme law of the land. So we see there was actually not supposed to be any change in the way the government was run, but as, as we know from history, that was not the case. Um, unfortunately, Israel's king did not follow this plan most of the time. They worshiped strange gods, they led the people astray, and they were often defeated by their enemies. There is only one king that we can put our complete trust in. The one thing in this world that will never fail. Revelation 17, 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So let's not follow any earthly king, but let us fly the flag of the almighty king of heaven, Amen. who reigns eternally, his kingdom shall not pass away.
So when you're a soldier in an army, you need a base that you can go to. A safe place to go where you can find rest and restock on supplies. The Bible refers to a place like this. Speaking of our spiritual, spiritual base, this is often called a refuge. Now the dictionary defines a refuge as shelter or protection from danger or distress, a place that provides shelter or pr protection or something to which one has recourse in difficulty. We need to make God our refuge because God, with God is the only place that is truly safe. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. When we have God on our side, there is nothing to fear. There is no situation we will ever be in that is out of his control. So how do we make God our refuge? It's easy to trust in a physical fortress, one that you can see. But a spiritual fortress is a little more difficult. We need faith to believe in what we can't see. Psalm 62, 7 and 8. In God and my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. God wants us to give us our, his, our whole heart. Now, there are many other passages, especially in the Psalms. Um, one that is very common is Psalm 91. But I have to believe that Martin Luther drew inspiration from these passages when he wrote the words to our next song. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing.
but we just celebrated a holiday a few days ago. What was that? Fourth of July, yes. Yeah. So since we are near Fourth of July, we thought we throw in a little patriotic theme here. So America as it exists today should have never happened. This little band of Minutemen took on the world's largest and most powerful army at the time and won. Now there's no other country that's been set up like the United States. It is the only country that has ever been founded in an idea. The idea that liberty should be its core principle. That God has given every person rights that the government could not give, but more importantly, could not take away. For our forefathers, the Puritans, back in 1600s, left Europe in search of a new world so they could practice their religion as they saw fit. But they soon fell into the same practices that they had left back in Europe. The Puritans did not fully understand the concept of religious liberty. The freedom that they sought in the new world, they were not so ready to grant this freedom to others. In a book written by William Martin on the um, Great Reformation, it says, very few, even of the foremost thinkers and moralists of the 17th century, had any just conception of that grand principle, the outgrowth of the New Testament, which acknowledges God as the sole judge of human faith. Soon, church attendance became required or, um, yeah, and required in order to vote. A sort of church state had been set up. Everyone was required to support the clergy, and the magistrates were authorized to suppress heresy. The secular authority had once again returned to the hands of the church. Sound familiar? It wasn't long before persecution ensued. However, all hope was not lost for this new world. Along comes Roger Williams. He arrived in Boston in February of 1631. Not a good time to be in Boston. And he held these three basic tenets. He believed that the Puritans needed to be separate from the Church of England, which he saw as increasingly corrupt. He believed in the principle of freedom of religion. And he also believed that the official government needed to stay out of church affairs. These principles had fueled his early work in England, his move to the colonies, and they would come to define his life work. Now, Williams was the first person in modern Christendom to establish civil, go civil government on the doctrine of the liberty of conscience, the equality of opinions before the law. Now, because of his radical beliefs, he was eventually kicked out of his colony and forced to wander in the woods for 14 weeks until he was finally uh, picked up by an Indian tribe that saved him. But it was these principles that our country was founded on. In a report to Congress in March of 1830, it says, the framers of the Constitution recognized the eternal principle that man's relation with his God is above human legislation and his rights of conscience inalienable. Reasoning was not necessary to establish this truth. We are conscious of it in our own bosoms. And it is this consciousness which in defiance of human laws has sustained so many martyrs in tortures and flames. They felt that their duty to God was superior to human enactments and that man could exercise no authority over their conscience. It is an inborn principle which nothing can eradicate. Amen. Now, this is official governmental paperwork. We haven't heard anything like that in a long time. I have to believe that the framers of the Constitution were led by God. If you look at all the governments and empires throughout history, they all tried to take as much power for themselves with little regard for the will of the people. But sadly, as much as we enjoy these liberties and the framers espouse them as unalienable, we know that we will not always hold these, always hold these principles dear. But take courage, my fellow soldiers, because the battle is almost over. 
we are about to come out of the night and into the glorious day because mine eyes have seen the coming of the, of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Now, the Battle Hymn of the Republic was written in 1861 by Julia Ward Howe as encouragement for the Union soldiers as they began the Civil War. Now, if you read through the words of this song, they are no less important for our battle that we fight today. So please ponder on the words as we play. Battle Hymn of the Republic.
Now, to be a soldier, you need something to fight with. Thankfully, God does not leave us defenseless. In Israel's day, they used swords, bows, and spears. Today, we use guns, tanks, and fighter jets. But unfortunately, none of these things will help us on our quest for victory. Because here's why. Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So how are we supposed to fend off this unseen foe? Thankfully, the Bible has an answer for that too. Ephesians 6, 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Dropping down to verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. So we first have to put on the belt of truth. And just like a belt, truth is the thing that holds everything all together. It's the foundation on which everything is laid. John 8, 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There is freedom in the truth. Often we think of the truth as restrictive and exclusive, but John tells us the exact opposite. We can have freedom in the truth of God's word. The second half of verse 14, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the purpose of this piece is that it protects your vital organs. When we take on Christ's righteousness, it protects us from all the accusations and charges Satan can throw at us. Now, verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It is our mission to take the good news of the gospel to the world. And so we're going to need some comfortable shoes to do it. And verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So when ta Satan attacks us with doubts, the shield of faith turns aside the blow. When temptations come, Faith keeps us steadfast in following Christ. But just like righteousness, we cannot obtain faith on our own. Romans 12, 3 says, According as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. God, is every, God has given everyone a little bit of faith. And it is our responsibility to ask him to grow that faith every day. In verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. The helmet protects the head, probably your most important organ. This is where our thoughts sit and our actions are determined. When we accept the gift of salvation, we are telling God that we are completely his. But you may be wondering, can we be sure of our salvation? The Bible says yes, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this is life in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. And lastly, taking the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. Now the sword is the only offensive list, uh, weapon listed in this, uh, uh, in this passage here. But when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, what did he use to fend off temptation? The word of God, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So once we have put on the whole armor of God. We must arise in the strength of Christ and move forward to victory. And now our next song, you may, you may recognize it, but that's not the song we're playing. Um, we're playing the less familiar version. So we're playing the tune of Crown Him With Many Crowns, but it's also the tune to number 616, Soldiers of Christ Arise. Uh, and this was also arranged by our very own Daniel Oriana. It's not the world premiere, however. It's the second performance of this song. Uh, but we're very grateful uh, for his work. 
And we hope you enjoy the song, but please take out your hymnals, turn to 616, follow along with the words of the song as we play, Soldiers of Christ Arise.
So as we wind our service down today, every soldier needs a cause to fight for. Without a cause, there is no mission to rally around. Everyone cannot fight their own battles with their own interests in mind and expect your side to gain victory. There is one standard we must fight under, one flag to wave. Because this battle will take the everything we have and then some. There needs to be a cause far, far greater than ourselves. Because otherwise we would just tuck our tails and run. Our scripture reading today, 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So what Paul is telling Timothy here, that being a soldier is tough. He uses the word, I haven't seen it quite like this before, but we must endure hardness. That's putting it very bluntly. We can't worry about the cares of this life that drag us down. And our one mission is to please the one who has chosen us to be a soldier. So what is this mission to fight for? The one standard we will wave. That standard is the cross. Without the cross, we have nothing. Satan would have been proven right that God's law is not just. It cannot be kept. The cross is the one thing that gives us hope for our dark and dying world. Without it, there is no hope. But he not only died for us, he became one of us. 1 Peter 2.24 who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. He took on our sins so that we could live again. What better cause is there to fight for? He gave his life for us, and we should live for him. Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He felt every pain that you and I could ever experience. He knows exactly what we're going through. The creator of the universe took on our mortal bodies and became one of us to win us back and save us from eternal death. So how do we become a soldier of the cross? Luke 9.23 tells us how. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross daily and follow me. Every day we have to choose to take up that cross. Or we can choose to defect to the other side. It's up to us. God never promises us an easy life. There are many battles to be fought every day. But he does promise to walk with us in our darkest hour. Won't you pick up that cross and follow him? Now our last song today, you guys get to participate. Uh, it's a little lesser known song, but made famous by the Collinsworth family. At Calvary. The words will be up on the screen and we will uh, play along. Pay attention to the words of this song. Let's go ahead and stand. We'll do our last song. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not, my Lord. 
Lord was crucified, knowing that it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. word at last my sin I learned then I trembled at the law I spurned till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary mercy there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there What do you say, church? Amen. I want to thank the Perpetual Praise String Ensemble for the, this beautiful sacred concert. I've been blessed. I'm sure our church has been blessed as well. Thank you so much for coming out and sharing your gifts, but not only your gifts, but a message. And we're so blessed to know that God is calling us, his church today, to enroll in these last final stages of the great controversy. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much. Let's pray. Let's pray as we close our service today. Father. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace. We want to give you the praise and the glory and the honor. You are our king. You are our God. And we thank you, Lord, for the reminder, Lord, on Calvary. We the reminder that Calvary, you have laid out everything, Lord, for us. And we thank you so much, Lord. So all we can do in return, Lord, our only response, the only faithful response that we want to give is a total surrender of our hearts to you, Lord. We want to be used by you, Lord. We want to be led by your spirit, Lord, to go forth and to proclaim the good news of Calvary. And we thank you, Lord. Bless us now, Lord. Bless our people, Lord, as we continue to worship and go through this Sabbath day. And we give you all the glory and all the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, I pray.